Uh, well, my name's Lorraine Wood, but I was born Lorraine Carol Bull. And the bull was a name I always hated as a child. We got teased terribly at school. And when I became a school teacher, it was even worse because I'd go into a classroom and put my name on the board and all the kids would go <laughs> like this. So I was very happy to get married and change my name. When I looked back over my life, one of the people that probably had a big influence on it was my maternal grandmother. And it quite surprised me when I thought about it because I never really thought about her having an influence on me, but she used to talk a lot and, and she was quite grumpy. Um, she was the oldest of three sisters and she was fairly naive and unworldly. And I always thought of her as fairly grumpy. She used to call me a, a cheeky young faggot. Get out of the road, you cheeky young faggot, she used to say. I don't know what a faggot was, but that's what she used to call me. She told me these interesting stories about the family. And I, I used to hang on every word. And, uh, and I sort of built a romantic idea up about families through what she said, because she had five daughters and one son. And they, the American Marines were in Auckland during the war and they used to bring them all home and there was lots of parties. And, and I think that influenced me later, wanting to have a family and have them all close together so we could all grow up and have these wonderful parties. But one of the things that she told me that always touched my heart was about my Aunt Olive. In, in, um, in the, my grandmother herself was actually a great beauty. There's, there's this photo here of her when she was 16, when she won a beauty contest in Masterton in New Zealand and got a gold watch. And all her daughters were very beautiful women. And her second, or no, third daughter was Olive. And she was just a little bit older than my mother. And Olive was one of the beauty, the great beauty of the family. It was during the Depression that they were growing up and she had a job in Mackenzie's in Queen Street in Auckland and everyone was losing their jobs in the Depression but they kept Olive on working there because people used to come into the shop to have a look at her because she was so beautiful. I don't know how old she was, maybe 18 or 19. She saved up and she came over to Sydney for a trip which was a big thing in 1937 or so. And she met her future husband here, Asher, Asher Hart. And he came back and they got married. And this is a photo of their wedding where you can see Olive and Asher and my grandfather. It was a tragic story because she got pregnancy TB and she, was, she died before her first wedding anniversary. And she was actually buried on her wedding anniversary. And I always remember my grandmother telling me about the priest saying that this day a year ago I married this girl and that there was, wasn't a dry eye in the church. And um, my grandmother never had much time for my father. She used to put him down and I don't know why she didn't like him. But she always, the one thing she ever said is that we would never have got through the funeral if it hadn't been for your father. He had a bottle of whiskey and he gave us all a, nip, a drink. I don't know, between, after the service or something. And she said, I'll never forget him at that. And it always sort of touched my heart in one way. And yet later with the history of addiction in our family, I look back and think what a typical conversation, <laughs> typical thing that, you know, at, a, at their worst moment, they brought out a bottle of whiskey. And, and then as I grew up, I used to he hear lots of stories about Asha, her husband because he was an Australian and he came back to Australia after, the, after she died and the war broke out and he went uh, uh, off fighting for Australia and was sent up to Burma and worked on the Burma Railway. And he was, was in a camp throughout all the war and then came back to Australia and the family lost touch with him. And somehow he was a romantic figure in my head and I had photos of him and I always wanted to see him. And maybe when I was about 27, 28, uh, my husband at the time and I went to Australia and it was my very first trip overseas. And I was determined to find Asher Hart. And we came to Sydney and I get, the first thing I do is get out this great yellow pages 
and start going through it. No, it wasn't the yellow, it was the ordinary book. And I started going through every A heart in the book. I don't know how many I rang, but it must have been 20 or 30. And with one of them, I said, my name's Lorraine. And I said, well, Lorraine Bull, you won't know who I am, but I'm from. And this voice said, I know exactly who you are, Lorraine Bull. Oh, my goodness, it was so... Um, just such an amazing connection because he hadn't seen me since I was two. And he said, where are you? And I said, I was staying in the Manhattan Hotel at King's Cross. And he said, I'll come straight in and see you. And he was living at Maroubra. And he came in and we just sat and talked. We talked for hours and hours and he took us out and showed us all around Sydney. And I always remember one of the first things he said to me, was your mother was one of the most irresponsible people I've ever met in my life. And it, it helped me so much because I never really understood my mother and father. And that helped me to see them from another perspective. And he told me about how that mum and dad came over and, and, and they had these holidays together and, um, and what it was like. My father was an abused and neglected child and he was illegitimate and was abandoned and had a really tough time but he grew up to be an amazing man in many ways. He was a New Zealand champion cyclist, he was a um, champion boxer, they used to, he was in the Navy and they used to bring the um, Golden Gloves champions out from America and Dad was never beaten in the heavyweight. And, um, and, and just, he met my mother, who was also, you know, very beautiful, fun, and, and she could sing and dance and, and very irresponsible. And really, she should never have married. She should have been on the stage having a wonderful time because she could take people off and she was extremely amusing. Just before they got married, Dad was here in Sydney and he bought a ticket in Tats and they won. And so, and it was 7,000 pounds which in 1936 was like winning about $7 million today. So, you know, they got married and they absolutely had the world at their feet. They, had, they were both great looking, great sense of humour, intelligent, wealthy. They bought a lovely home in Epsom. And you would think that, you know, they'd be set for a wonderful life. But sadly, they both were addicts. They were alcoholics, gamblers and um, codependent. And their life, from that moment, that was their high point. From then, it was just a path that was downward. And Dad really spent his whole life, I don't think, in depression. I don't remember Dad ever really being happy. And um, my mother is 96 and still alive today, but she's lost her mind. So they paid a, a very heavy price for their addiction. Mum did try to get sober about three times, but... She couldn't, couldn't maintain it. And um, it had a big effect on us children. I was the eldest of six. And my sister, Nolene, and I <coughs> were born before the war. And the other four came after the war. And I was the, um, the favourite and the special dad's little princess. And it was always a family joke that I think I was about two when one day... Dad was there, he, he was the light of my life, and the next day he was gone. He was overseas to the, to, off to war. And um, there's a photo here of, of my mother and father and myself on Auckland Wharf the day Dad sailed on the Leander. He, um, war broke out on the Friday. Dad got a telegram on the Saturday morning because he had been in the Naval Reserve. But when he got them, won the money, he bought himself out of the Naval Reserve, which cost him a thousand pounds. Everything he did with the money was just ridiculous because it's only 12 months later, war broke out and he was the first to be called up. So he was at work. He, had, he used to have a, a cycling shop in Karangahappy Road in Auckland. <coughs> and so mum got, rang him up and said, oh, there's a telegram here to say that you've got a report for duty. So he, he packed up, came home, and he and mum packed up and put me in the back of the car, and they went away for the weekend and pretended they didn't get the telegram. And when he came back on Monday morning, he rang the Navy headquarters and said he'd only just got the telegram, and they said, we'll be in here by 9 o'clock to get a fitting for your uniform. 
And that was the Monday morning. I came home Monday night and back in Tuesday morning and at four o'clock Tuesday afternoon, he arrived home and said to mum that he sails at six o'clock. And this is the photo taken on the wharf and um, he sailed. That, why is that affecting me so much? And um, he was away for, I think for six months the first time and then he went away for four years, which was a long time. I always remember, so I used to get a lot of headaches and I said to mum once, did you ever get headaches? And she said, no, the only headache I ever had in my life was the day dad sailed. And it was always a family joke that when he came back from overseas the first time, they were standing in Queen Street and all the sailors marched up and they were <coughs> taken up to the town hall and given lunch and <coughs> all the family had to wait until they came out. But somebody was holding me up and I recognised him straight away and I called out, there's my father and aren't I the spitting image of him? <laughs> so I remembered. <laughs> For our generation, it's quite hard to imagine being married and having someone going off to war, but they really had it tough, that generation, and they were very stoic and they never complained. I, I never, Dad would never discuss the war. But I do remember Mum saying that when he came back, he was an alcoholic. He was very different to the man who went away. But it must have been tough on her too because she had two little ones and as I said, she wasn't responsible and Dad had left her in charge of his business that he had. And he, she, I've, we've still got the letters that he wrote her and he used to say, you know, now, that, now dear, you're doing a very good job looking after the business but don't give Slater any money, who was Dad's partner. And I don't know what happened but Slater got the business off them somehow. I remember mum telling me how one day she was walking home and there was a sandwich board beside a dairy and it said Leander, Leander sunk all on board lost and my dad was on the Leander and she you know there was no TV and news or anything and oh she got such a shock and she saw this so she rushed home and the first thing she did was to ring her older sister Auntie Leela and Leela was always very calm and she said now don't worry about it, just get, it, just cook yourself and have a cup of tea and just wait and see, it mightn't be true, it might be just a false, a false um, report. And they had to wait two days and sure enough it was a false report, it was a different boat that had been sunk. But can you imagine, you know, what they had to go through really? And I can remember as a kid playing on Takapuna Beach and you couldn't go into the water <coughs> because there was um, barbed wire right up high because we were expecting it to be invaded by the Japanese. And I can remember as a kid also, I used to have nightmares at night dreaming about the Nazis and I had no idea what a Nazi was, but I was really scared about them. I must have heard people talking. And I think there was a lot of collective fear at that time. People didn't know what was gonna happen. The other part about the war that was so, had such a profound effect on me. And somebody said to me the other day, can you tell me what was the happiest day of your life? And, I, and I've been thinking about it. And one of the days that, I don't know whether it was actually my happiest day, but a day it was VE Day, Victory in Europe Day. And I can, I'll never forget it as long as I live. I <coughs> was about eight years old. And my mother and I were making the bed. We were in Wellington because Dad had returned from the war and he was in charge of, of the railway, of all transport in and out of Wellington at the end of the war. And we were making this bed and all of a sudden, all the sirens started going all over the city, all this noise. And, you know, I was scared and I said, what is it? And Mum said, oh, it must mean the war's ended. And the next thing, the phone went and Dad said he was sending someone around to pick us up. And the next thing, a jeep pulls up outside. We lived in a block of flats. And mum and my sister Nolene and I get in the jeep. <coughs> and they take us to the um, Admiral's headquarters at the naval base. And the, na the Admiral of the Navy in Wellington was having a party. And I can remember this as clearly as anything going. People were all over the streets. And it was early in the morning. And it was just starting. And we were at the, at the naval base all day. And... The Admiral said to my sis young sister, 
what would you girls, I said to both of us, what would you girls like to drink and have us to celebrate? You know, and I said, oh, I'll have a lemonade, please. And he said to Nolene, what would you like, young lady? And she said, I'll have a whiskey, please, but I'll have it straight. <laughs> she was about, I don't know, maybe four. Anyway, we had such a great, everyone was making a fuss of us. We were the only children there and they were dancing with us and talking and throwing us around. We'd never had such a time. And on the way, then it was time to go home and we got back in the Jeep and they drove us down through. There was a naval officer driving, mum and dad and Noel and I were in the back and um, the Jeep was open and they were driving us down Cuba Street and, and Willow Street in Wellington and it was th you, the jeep couldn't move, you know, it was p just people everywhere. And I remember men with only underpants on up on the um, up, up lampposts and everybody singing and laughing and drinking and the music. And it's, it's something I'll never forget. I can still, you know, I can just feel the vibrations and, and the, I can see the people's faces even though I was only eight and it was one of my very earliest memories. Very special. <laughs>
And then when I left school, I worked in Ekatahuna for a year as a shorthand typist, but I soon realised that Ekatahuna was <laughs> back of beyond, and so I applied for training college and went to Wellington Teachers Training College. And that I had two of the best years of my life. I, I flattered with six other girls, and I'm still friends. We just cel celebrated our 75th birthdays about a month ago. And we're all alive and all well and still fight and <laughs> still good friends. After I left training college, I did my PA year, and that was when I met Arnold, the girl's father. We got married in 1959 and had four children, four girls in four years, and lived on a farm in Ekatahuna until, I think the youngest was until Franny was born at three, and then we moved to the Waikato, it was much warmer up there, and that's where Joanne was born in Te Aroha. And we lived there for six years, and Tierra was a lot of fun too. We made a lot of friends there and used to have lots of parties and go to the races. Country life was, um, it was very full and people were very involved. I was in the Mother's Club, president of the Mother's Club, and we used to put on great concerts. And But suddenly one day I was looking out the window and all I could see was cows. And I used to think, you know, I was a real people person and still am. And, I used to think, surely I can be somewhere where I can be with people. So I talked my poor, long-suffering husband into going to the city, which was a great shame, really, because it suited me, but he really was a country boy. And it was not long after we went to the city that, um, that, that the marriage dissolved, and I ended up marrying Bill Wood, and um, Arnold married Linda. And we're still good friends today. He's a very good man, and uh, we just grew apart. Married Bill Wood, who was an Australian, and then we had a daughter of our own called Fleur. So I ended up with five daughters, and Bill had three girls, so we had eight daughters between us. So I know quite a bit about girls, but not much about boys. Although, fortunately, I've got ten grandchildren, and, and four, five of them are boys, so I'm learning a bit about them. <laughs> the second time I met Bill, he walked into a room one day and he said, hello Lorraine, and, and I said, hello Bill, and an electric current went across the room. It was just something you read about, and I'd never experienced anything like that. And um, it was just love at second sight for both of us. And, you know, we were, he was my best friend. We were good business partners. He was my husband, my lover, my father of my daughters. And I always think I was very lucky to have met Bill. And, and he was too, we, we complimented each other. And um, we were married for nearly 30 years. And of course you have ups and downs, but most of the time we, we had a very good relationship. And when things got tough with when shifting countries and with eight children, there were many difficult times. But the tougher things got, the better we got on. We always pulled together. Um, he was a good man and he, he had a great sense of humour, which I never really understood. I, when I met him in New Zealand, I, I always thought he was different to anybody I'd ever met. I thought he was totally unique. And then when I, he, we came to Australia and I realised he was just a typical Aussie Ocker, I said to him one day, you're not different, you're just an Aussie. <laughs> and he was a bit, a bit, you know, not impressed with that. But we lived for eight years in New Zealand and, and the economy wasn't good there. And we kept reading about the wonderful things that were happening over in Australia. And one day he had a real estate magazine and, and it said that the average income for, for uh, New Zealand real estate agents was um, about $8,000. And in Australia, it was 17. And he kept reading this article all night. And the next day, he got on a plane and came over to see if it was right. And I remember he rang me and he said, you better start packing, baby. That's better here than what you can imagine. And within six weeks, we were packed up, sold our home and living in Sydney. And 
And oh my goodness, it was hard at first. We, some of the girls had grown up and left home, some came with us. And we had to rent and um, it wasn't as easy as what we had thought. But it's always hard shifting in a country and learning new customs and new ways. And I think we were both on wages and rents were expensive and daycare for Fleur. I, think, I don't think we had anything left. We had to live on our capital, which we didn't have a lot of, but we knew we had to get into real estate. And we eventually, we started on our own, but that didn't work out. And Bill knew that he had to buy a business. And one day he saw one advertised in Lane Cove and it was for 85000 and he said he was going to go and try and buy this business. And I looked at him in horror and said, how do you think you get, you know, we only had about 20, 20 or 30000 He said, don't worry, I'll fix it. So this business was called McDiamonds and there was a lot of jealousy among all the agents at that time and they were all wanting to buy his business but they were only offering him seventy five thousand for it so bill was smart we had a had a mercedes and he parked that a few blocks away and walked up to the office and he said to ian look i think i can see your business is worth what you're asking i'll pay that so this guy sold, was happy to sell it to bill he didn't want to sell it to the locals he'd had 35 replies and bill got he gave it to bill so and i can remember bill coming in home so he's, he's agreed to sell it to me and I just felt sick. Well, how are you going to pay for it? And he said, oh, don't worry, I'll go and see the bank. So he went to the bank and sure enough, the bank gave him most of the money. But, you know, we'd only just arrived in Australia. We had no record or nothing. Anyway, he was $5,000 short. So he goes back to Ian and says, look, Ian, I really want this business, but I'm $5,000 short. He said, will you leave it in for 12 months? This guy said, yep. Yeah. So that was how we got into, into real estate. And we both got working so hard and we loved it. It was just fantastic. We only had about 350 properties, but Bill would go out and he'd buy another property and bring it home. He'd bring home in a manila fold and he'd say, they are beautiful, I've bought you another business. And I'd just get cracking and <laughs> do all the work. He was a character, but... We had, it was on a corner and it was just a little office and we, it was only four of us in the beginning. And then we start, there was a garage underneath. So we did that up, cost us about maybe 10 or 15,000. We were renting the premises so that we could employ a couple of more salesmen. And we'd just bought a house in Lane Cove and spent 50,000 on that. But you know, we, we were making quite good money and getting on our feet. I remember at one stage, we counted up our assets and we'd arrived in Sydney with 30,000 and we were worth 300,000. And I remember we were both feeling that we'd done really well in a matter of just a few years. But he used to sit on this corner and he'd look at Blunt's across the road, which was a big three-storey building. And they were the original real estate company in, in Lane Cove. They'd been going for maybe 45 years. And he used to say, I'm going to buy that business one day. And I'd say, oh, so stupid you know how are you possibly going to buy that you just just wait he said i'll buy it one day and rob blunt was was the son of the owner the owner had retired and rob was an artist he wasn't a real estate person and, and you could see he didn't like the business because he used to shut himself up in there and they were never open in the weekends and we we used to go over and pick people off their windows and sell them <laughs> anyway Bill used to, every time Bill saw Rob walking up the street, he'd go over and catch him and have a chat with Rob. And one day he says, Rob, if you ever decide to sell your business, will you give me the first option to buy it? And Rob was very shocked because you could see he'd never thought of selling it. And he said, certainly, Bill, if you do the same for me. And Bill said, Rob, if I ever decide to sell you the first, I'll call. And I, Bill told me this, and I just thought, what an idiot, you know. You're... Would you believe it, within a week, Bill gets a call from Rob, could you come over? Oh, my God, I felt sick. I could see this big building. How are we going to get the money? And Bill comes back grinning like mad. Yep, he wanted to sell the business, and he wanted 500000 half a million. I mean, that was, oh, my God, in 
the early 80s, you know, that was a lot of money and we, we didn't have much. And so we just put, spent 50000 on our house and we'd borrowed that. So we, Bill was very excited, but when he woke up the next morning, I don't know whether it, it had hit him or whether he was acting, I'll never know. But he, he went back, he to, had told Rob the day before, yep, he'll buy it. And then he went back in the morning and he said to him, look, Rob, I've thought it over and there's no way I can raise 500000 And so he said, I'll, I'll have to let it go. And he came back, but he didn't seem too upset. And as I think about it, I think it was all part of his plan because Rob wanted to sell this business and it wasn't doing that great. And I don't think he wanted to hawk it round. So Bill just left it with him. And about a week later, Rob came back, asked Bill to come over again. And he said, Bill, I'll leave the money in. How, how much can you put in? And Bill said, 25,000. And he said, all right, you put, give me the 25,000. And he said, I'll leave the money in for a year and then you can repay me. Bill shook his hand and said, deal done. And that's how we bought the, that building on, on 25,000 deposit. And it had two little shops at the bottom. And I remember thinking, oh, thank God they're there. At least there'll be some income coming in. And we shifted across with our two salesmen. And the bit, from the day we got there, we were open seven days and there was so much enthusiasm. And Bill was a, a great real estate man. And we just kept doubling our staff. And we had, in the end, we had to get the tenants out of the shop so that we had more room and he'd kept buying properties. And we ended up with nearly a thousand properties we were managing. We had a team of 25 and for, we won every um, advertising award. We had, um, in, in, the, in the Sydney Morning Herald. And, um, you know, Lee was working with us at the time, one of our daughters, and she was a top real estate agent for auctioneers among out of a hundred offices because we were part of the professionals group. So it was it was a very exciting time. Over a 400% return on a Yellow Pages investment. Recently, we got a million dollar waterfront property to sell thanks to our Yellow Pages ad. We took over Lane Cove at Bluntstead. We were, Bill was the first to start auctioning. I feel good, I feel great, I feel terrific because I'm a professional. I remember how it started. We went to a seminar at Armadale University on real estate. I talked Bill into going to it because we were getting bigger and I, and I realised that we needed to become more professional. So we went up to this week-long um, residential course at Armadale University and there was a guy there from uh, Tony, someone from Melbourne, and that he was talking auctions. Auctions was all they did in Melbourne and we didn't have many auctions in Sydney. So we stopped in a motel on the way home and we wrote up our business plan. I'm sure it was a very crude business plan, but it worked. And auctions was one of them. The first thing Bill did was to go to, to Melbourne and work out how, how they did their auctions. And he came back and he started them. And that just was how our, we started making a fortune with, with our auctions. We took over Lane Cove and, and the whole area. And some Saturdays we used to have 20 auctions and Bill did them himself with, and Lee used to help him. We worked long hours, but it was really exciting and, and very encouraging and we had a great team and, and Bill and I were a great team together. My children have been brought up with a very hard work, work ethic. I, I've, I've always been a hard worker ever since I was a kid. In fact, I'm a workaholic. I guess it's my drug of choice. And I think work is important. Bill was a hard worker if he was interested, but if he wasn't interested, he wouldn't do it. So working is important, but I think it's more important to find what your passion is, what what you really love. And if you don't know what your passion is, they say if you keep asking the universe for 40 days in a row, you will know. And I was very lucky that I found out what my passion was, which was recovery. I found that in, in 1986, but that's another story. And I've followed my passion since 1986. And I've been so lucky because 
when you're in alignment and you're following your passion, you know in your heart, you know when you hear the truth, you know it. And I've always been very optimistic. I can't stand being around people that are pessimistic or fearful. And um, I've and I and I've always had a knowingness, and I've I've known when it's been right and what things to do. And I and I have a a gut feeling of with people. I know. I have a feeling with people as soon as I see someone and employ someone and I'm very rarely wrong and I didn't used to trust that but I do now and so what I could say now is to f trust you find your passion and follow it no matter what it is I think Lee's a great example as my eldest daughter now she's starting a new career and she's following a passion and she's enthusiastic and I can see it's going to be a great success because it's what she wants to do. She's passionate. You know, don't don't settle for second best. Don't settle certain jobs that you're bored with because it's safe and secure. Take a risk. But it needs to be a calculated risk. And and then put your heart and soul into it. And if you're in alignment and you're doing things that help people or that are for the for the better good of people, things work out. It always works out. It certainly has for me. Life isn't perfect. I lost Bill in the year 2000 and I've been widowed now for 13 years. Um, but, but you do come through grief. The pain goes. It took a long time, two, three years. And this has been a great growth period for me. And in some, some ways, Bill's, Bill's death was a gift because it, within the relationship I could never really be equal. Women of my generation, we were automatically won down. And being on my own, I've had to grow and make decisions and I've, I'm a very different person who, who was married to Bill and I'm independent and I've done well. My, my daughters are very different to the young girl that I was. They expect equality. I don't know that you ever can get equality in a marriage because I think men and women are different and we, we come together as the different sides of a coin. And I think women always have to do more around the house you know, I've, I've had this argument with my daughters many times to do, they would expect 50-50, and I think they're whipping a dead horse, because I don't think you can ever get men to do that. Men are different, and I think this, it's the sooner we learn to accept that, the better. And, and we, we, I think women do work harder. We have to run a house, we have, we have the babies, and most of us want a career. But what, how you do, well, one thing with Bill, he never really cared how much help I got, which was a big help. You know, if you have a housekeeper and you have a secretary, these, as you get on, you, it's about self-care. And you can do these things, but you must have the, uh, the help and the support. I was brought up a Catholic, but very contradictory because my parents didn't live they weren't practicing Catholics. And then I went to a convent and I was filled with fear. And, um, and it was a God of vengeance. And, and I was always scared I was going to die in mortal sin because I hadn't been to confession or I'd eaten meat on Fridays. And so it was, it was a religion that didn't give me any comfort or support. And when I was in, at 1986, I must have been in my what, late 50s, late 40s, I can't remember, but I came across 12-step programs and today I call myself a recovering Catholic and, you know, I'll always be a Catholic. I love the church and it's, I take what I want and leave the rest, but there's a difference between religion and spirituality. Religion, like the Catholic Church, where there's a hierarchy and they tell you how to, how to pray and how to live your life, it's man-made. To me, spirituality is about a direct connection between yourself and some power that's greater than you. I had choose to call it God. I have no idea who God is, and I don't even care very much. 
but all I know is that there's some power that's greater than me. And when I ask for help that is for the, for the good of my soul, I get it. Miracles happen, all sorts of things. And um, it's the most important thing in my life by far. And I live my life by these spiritual principles. You know, there's a saying in AA that if you can't get on your knees to pray, throw something under the bed and bend down. And, you know, I, I couldn't get on my knees for many years. I didn't think I ever needed to, but today I do. And most, most nights and most mornings I get on my knees and pray before I get into bed. And I pray to the God of my understanding. And I don't think it matters much who your God is, whether it's, you know, the sunshine, being in the air, whether it's um, Buddha or it's whatever it is that gives you solace, support and comfort. And um, I know when things are too much for me, I just put them in the, the hands of, I, sometimes I call it the universe, I, it, to myself I call it God, but when I'm talking to people I often call it the universe because I think that's more acceptable. But I just say, look, this is too much for me, God, you handle it. And somehow, you know, it takes the stress out of your life. I don't have to worry if I see kids sick or one of my kids in trouble and there's nothing I can do, I just hand it over. And somehow things always work out. Miracles happen for me in my life. You know, in 12-step programs, they say, if you follow the guidelines we set out, you'll find a life beyond your wildest dreams. And that's happened for me. One of my sisters, Nolene, looked up our family history on my father's side and came across the most amazing letter, beautifully written by Mary Ann. And she came out from England in the early 1800s and she had 10 children, can you believe? And why they came out was because they, it was very cold and some of the children had bronchitis and they, couldn't, they weren't doing well in England. And there was the talk of the Edward Gibbon Wakefield scheme in New Zealand. And if they came out, they were promised some land. So they made this huge trip out, took months. And they arrived on the west coast of New Zealand, which is as rough as all hell. And the, her, this lady was Mary Ann and she, they arrived on the beach and the Maoris came to welcome them. And they were terrified and she had this great crinoline on and all the kids hid underneath, or some of the smaller kids hid underneath her dress. And the Maoris were doing the, the welcome to them, the haka and different things. And they were absolutely petrified. And then one, the, one of the kids peeked out from under the dress and the Maoris all started laughing. And then Maori said it was like the, the chicken with the chook with all the um, chickens under its feathers. And then her letter goes on to, to say how hard it was. And for the first few years, they had to grow their own food. But the amazing thing was they all lived, they're all in Nelson in a cemetery now. And of course, and they lived to be about 90. There was only one who died young. So I've, we've got good genes in the family going right back. <laughs> oh, and Ed, Edward Gibbon Wakefield came out and to New Zealand and, um, and he, he used to sell the idea in New Zealand that to get, because he wanted to get people because there was nobody there except the Maoris. And so, you know, very brave people came out. And, and that it was a free colony. It wasn't like in Australia where there was convicts. And, um, and a lot of Scottish people came out. And, and we were never able to trace what happened to Dad. And we, we do know that um, his father was drowned in Napier three weeks before the wedding. So he was illegitimate. And his mother must have put him in a home or something. And for the first two years of his life, nobody knows what happened. But when he was two, he went to live with this Uncle Toby. Must have been a foster parent or something. And he used to beat him. And he wasn't allowed to have his meals with the family. He used to have to have it standing up in the scullery. 
and he learnt to steal. And Dad always t didn't tell me till he was 80 and dying that he could steal anything. He used to get down there and steal fruit, and I suppose that's how he kept himself alive. And when he was about eight, he ran away and bestowed aboard a ship in, the, in Napier. And I always believe angels come in all, all shapes and sizes. And before the ship sailed, this angel, the sailor, came and discovered Dad. And he said to him, you know, what are you doing stowing aboard here? And, and um, Dad said, Uncle Toby beats me. So this sailor took Dad back to Uncle Toby and he said, every time I'm in port, my mates and I are going to come round and if this kid's got any marks on him, we'll break your legs. So apparently the beating stopped. But not long after that, Dad came home from school one day and there was a lady standing in the middle of the room and she came up and kissed him on the cheek and she said, I'm your mother. And he didn't even know he had a mother. And it was the first time he'd ever been kissed and he hated it. And that set the pattern for our family. There was never any touch or, or, or kissing or hugging. And um, when Dad met my mother, he took her home to meet his mother. And when she left, Mum turned to Nana Bull and, and gave her a hug. And between the, the back door, the front door and the gate, Dad said to Mum, we don't do that in our family. So Mum shut down and, and there was, you know, it, it's so sad because we grew up with a family, in a family there where there was very little touch or, or it was a cold looking good family. And I never really learnt to be more warm and affectionate until I met Bill. Bill was very warm and loving. and um, But even today I, I don't find it easy to be affectionate. Fortunately my children are much more so. Well, I suppose I learnt to type on one of those old typewriters. Um, we listened to the radio. I can remember there was a serial on the radio called Thundering Hooves. And Nolene and I used to listen to that every once a week. Oh, we couldn't wait for Thundering Hooves. And there was this one big episode where the horse had got the bad girl in the in the um, <coughs> stable and she was and she was screaming and the horse was kicking her to death. And Dad came in and turned it off because it was very bad for us to listen to something so violent. I still don't know what happened to that girl in Thundering Hooves. We used to read at night. And there was a lot of reading. Um, and I remember when we first got television, Joanne was, was born and, and I, called, we, I was transferred from one hospital to another. And on the way, we passed our home and Arnold had bought television. And I came in and the kids were all sitting around watching the TV. And I think we used to, it used to start at 6 o'clock at night. It went from 6 till 10 at night. And at 10 o'clock, a little Kiwi used to come out and say, Good night. So all New Zealand packed up at 10 o'clock and went to bed. <laughs> when, when we started in real estate in the early 1980s, we had a, a kerosene copier which was the most complicated thing if we wanted to make copies. We'd fill it with kerosene and I could never work it and it was so complicated. And I used to do the um, statements with magnetic strips. Every, every property had a magnetic strip and we thought they were wonderful because, you know, you didn't, have, they weren't, you didn't have to write out all these things and you'd put these strips in. But I used to go into work at four o'clock in the morning to get them all out on the one day. For a phone we had a party line which there was one line that connected maybe 20 people on the one line and you all had a different ring like ours was S, three short rings. Somebody would be M and that would be too long. So you only answered the ring with, with it was three shorts which was yours. But if you lifted, say that M went, you could lift it and you could he listen in on the conversation. So as kids, we used to think this was great fun. And I remember once listening into the neighbours talking and my young brother was crying in the background. And I remember these people saying, I think there's someone listening, don't you? And they said, yes, I can hear someone crying in the background. <laughs> and I hung up quickly. <laughs> I guess they knew it was me. <laughs> so that was our telephone 
system that we were so, well, we were lucky to have it. But it used to be out the back. And I used to hate going to the toilet because it would be cold and freezing. And we used to have a, the, the sand, sand man that used to come round and empty your toilet once a week. <laughs> Unbelievable, isn't it? <laughs> well, I always had a washing machine, but I can remember the day my mother got her first washing machine. I must have been maybe 12 or so. And she washed right almost through the night. She put every sheet she had in the house. She, Because she used to boil the copper and wash it. <gasps> when she got that washing machine, everything in the house went through. She was so thrilled with it. And we had a fridge that lasted maybe 30 years. Things didn't work out, didn't ever wear out in those days. One of the naughty things I did when I was a kid, when I was growing up a bit teenage, I remember one New Year's Eve, I went out, it was my first New Year's Eve I'd been out, and we went, um, what did you call it? House hopping, or, or it's a special name they had for it. I've forgotten now. And we used to be the first, first footing. That's right, and I was with my boyfriend, and we went first footing all around the district. And I got home about five o'clock in the morning, I must have been maybe 16, and I'd never stayed out that late in my life. And as I came in the door, I could hear Dad's footsteps coming down the hall, and I thought, oh my God. And so I stuck in, I rushed into the pantry to hide, and because he was going to milk the cows, and I rushed into the pantry and, and hid behind the door. And what do you think? He had run out of matches and he walks out to the pantry to get the matches and he's half asleep and reeks over and looks down and sees my feet and he got such a <laughs> shock. And he said to me, what the hell are you doing here? And I was too scared to say anything and he just said, get to bed. <laughs> he never mentioned it again. I thought I'd get really told off. I was only 12 in my school and when I lived in Rongo Kakako. 12 kids. <laughs> So it was pretty, pretty basic education. Um, and at, at the convent, it was it was terrible. They wouldn't let us have the newspapers because we might read something that wasn't healthy. So we we, had, we were very poorly educated, really, in those days. In my day, if somebody went on a trip overseas, everybody would talk about it. It was so unusual. And, and people saved their money and they went for one trip. It was when you retired and, and that was the thing you did. You went on your one trip, you went away for three months and that was it. Whereas I, I, I was lucky enough, Arnold had taken insurance out for 300 pounds and it, came, uh, it, came, it became valid when he was 35. So he didn't know what to do with it. So I helped him come up with a good idea to go to Sydney. And that was our first trip. It cost us 66 pounds, which was what, about $120. It was in 19, about 1966 or something. And it was very hard to get money to take overseas. And we used to go to the post office and we got all our friends going and getting us 50 cents. That's you know, five shilling postal notes, and we went off with a big pile of five shilling postal notes. That's how we got money to go overseas in those days. Travel was unheard of, and you know, you never thought you'd you'd be travelling every day. Never in my wildest dreams did I think we'd travel like we are now. Never. When Mum and Dad won the money, and my grandfather being Australian, she shouted all the family a trip to Australia, and you know that was. No, but nobody did done that. You know, something I'd store my mother had travelled to Australia, but nobody else's parents had. It was very unusual. It's funny, um, there's often secrets in families. And when families have secrets, it's often about death, about sex, or about money. And we had a, a secret in our family that mum and dad had won huge prize and nobody ever discussed it um, and when my younger brother was maybe 40 or 50 somehow he found out and he said to me why ever didn't you tell us and I just looked at him in amazement I didn't know that he didn't know but unconsciously we were all protecting mum because they'd, they'd wasted so much of their money they um, dad bought his mother a house and mum bought her mother a house. 
And I always remember my grandmother saying to me that if it hadn't been for my mother, she'd have never had her own home because they were brought up in the Depression and it was tough and they never had a home. And she said she not only bought me this house in Mount Roskill, it was 21 Kingston Avenue, Mount Roskill. It's still there today. And she said she took me out and bought me if she furnished it. And she said she looked at the um, bedroom suites and she didn't know which one to get. And she said to, to my mother, I think I'd like to get twin beds, Nolene. And so she got twin beds for her, for her and Georgie, my grandfather. And I can remember those twin beds as clear as anything. As a child, I used to sleep in with Nana. Many years later, she gave, I remember she gave Dawn, her younger sister, a wedding. And she gave all her sisters 50 pound. And, um, then they ended up through their drinking virtually with nothing. And when my, grand, my grandmother died first and she left it to, to my grandfather, but she used to always say to me, when I die, this house will go back to your mother. And so when my grandfather had the money, I, I said to him one day, Georgie, Nana always said one day this house would go back to my mother and he said yes it should really because she did give it to us but he said I thought it was fairer to leave it to everybody. So he was old and 90 and I went and got some legal advice and I thought it was probably better to leave it until he died and then talk to the aunts and see if they would share it out, let mum have a bigger share because she had nothing. So after he died, there was a, the house was sold and there was about um, 20,000 pounds, I think. So I went to my aunts and said, look, you know, you've all got your own home and mum and dad have got nothing. Would you let her have half and then you all have the other half? Because if I could get the 10,000, we could have bought her a house. And at first they agreed, but then the next day they changed their mind and wouldn't hear of it. So Bill said, well, let's take it to court. And so we got the best solicitor in New Zealand, Stuart Enor, who, and that's re another piece of really good advice. If you ever have to go to court, get the best. And he, he wrote the law. He was very, very good. And we took it to court and it took a long time, took about a year, but we, we virtually won the case. He gave my mother 15,000 pounds and divided the rest between those who needed it. And one of the things he said in his summing up, he was very smart, he said, I have to wonder what Mrs. Bull did with her money that she's ended up in this position. But he said, what I believe is that it was what her mother said to me, Lorraine, that, um, you know, it put a roof over our head. He said, it's the sort of thing that somebody would say in, in the 19th, during the depression. And he said, I believe that she said that and that she would have wanted her daughter to have the house. So it caused quite a lot of problems in the family. My aunt, Leela, was very annoyed with me and said to me, you'll pay. And she left, she, I was apparently in her will and she took me out of her will and left all her money to my sister, Nolene. But I was delighted, you know, I didn't need auntie's money and um, my sister, Nolene, did, uh, you know, I was delighted she could do with that money. And and we were able to buy mum and dad a house and uh, for cash. And so it gave, and dad never said much, but once he said to me, if it hadn't been for you, we wouldn't have this house and I'll always be grateful. So I was very glad that I was able to do that. And it was Bill actually who who really pushed that and helped me with it. My mother was very lucky. She. Um, she not only won it this time, but Dad gave. Actually, when they won it, Dad, Mum was working, and she, he sent the ticket to her, and the lady at work said to her, um, you're wanted down at the office or something, and they gave her this ticket. And so she took it and put it in the bank until Dad got home because he was away at war. And my grandfather wanted Mum to cash it up. He said, "She's given he, Dad given you the ticket and it's your money. And Dad said, Mum said, no, Harry gave it to me and we'll go halves. So when Dad came back, they took half each. But at their engagement party, old Georgie Bowen got a bit drunk 
and he, he was only a little fellow, and he said to him, Dad was big, and he said to my dad, you are lucky you got half of that money because you gave the ticket to my daughter and she didn't have to give you half. And Dad got him and picked him up and shook him, and he said, don't you ever speak to me like that again. So there was never much um, friendliness between my dad and his father-in-law, I suppose you can understand. But that's what happens when people drink, I guess, because old Georgie was a, an alcoholic, that's for sure. There's many things in my life that I'm grateful for. Um, I'm grateful that my parents were alcoholics. That's, that's the thing I'm most grateful for because it took me on a journey into recovery, which is the most important thing in my life. But that's another story. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful to my first husband, Arnold, who never, ever has said a bad word about me to my children. And, um, and I never have about him. He's, he's been a great ex-husband. Um, I'm, I'm grateful to my grandparents. I, I think they were amazing people. You know, my grandmother lived with an alcoholic. <clears throat> she died young. I don't know how, she, how, they, how they survived living with addiction all their lives, but somehow they did. They were very stoic. They never complained. Um, I'm very grateful to my Auntie Leela, my mother's oldest sister, who used to have my sister and I for Christmas holidays for six weeks and gave us a great love of the beach. And I think it helped keep us alive because we were in a pretty unhappy household. And I love the beach to this day. She didn't have children and she poured a lot of love onto us. Um, I had a, a surrogate mother and father, Hazel and Ivan, who were my mother's cousins. And they never had children and they were wonderful to me. They took a great interest in my children. And, um, and we had many, lots of fun together and, and they left me some money, which was of great help. My children, my children have been my teachers. This is very true. Your children, you learn so much from your children. Um, and my kids have certainly <laughs> done a good job <laughs> teaching me. And I started off wanting to have what my grandmother had said is this wonderful, happy family. And I always had this vision that they would all adore me. They would be close. We'd grow up together and everything would be wonderful. And it didn't turn out like that when they were first growing up. But now it is, as they're all middle-aged women, they're very supportive, very loving, and I feel I now have the family that, um, in a different way, that I really always wanted. I feel very loved by my children, and and I know I can turn to all of them for for different in different ways and at different times, and for different needs. And I'm very proud of my children. Um, I'm not proud of what they do because I feel that, that they've all achieved in various fields and various ways, but I don't think that's because of me that they've done it. That's their talent. What I'm so proud of is that every one of my children are good women. They've all got big hearts. They're very generous. They take care of other people, and they're just good people, and that's what I'm proud of. Um, I think I can say today that I'm a good mother and I've got the data to prove it because every one of my children are very good women.